I'm your host, Christy hall Duran, Chief Philanthropy and Partnership Officer. Today, we're speaking with Scott Geiselhart, a former Assistant Chief from Frazee, Minnesota, Jaws of Life extrication team member, and current Certified Peer Support Specialist and Mental Health Practitioner working in mental health crisis stabilization. I'd also like to introduce you to today's panel, Captain Joseph Dewey and Apparatus Specialist James Fiala of Grand Forks Fire Department, Melanie Newman of Altru's Tears, and Nicole, a licensed therapist from the Community Violence Intervention Center. Thank you, panel, for joining today's discussion. And there'll be a question and answer session at the end for those in the audience today as well. Scott, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey? Um, I grew up in Detroit Lakes, Minnesota. Moved to Frazee in about 94. And I worked as a mechanic at Nearsons in Detroit Lakes, but a guy, the chief, approached me and said, hey, why don't you join the fire department? You know, you're, you're a mechanic, we could use that on the fire department. So I filled the applications out and got, got accepted onto the fire department. They voted me on, one of, one of the last persons I was allowed voted on. And um, I kind of, I went at it. I didn't know what to expect. Um, but it was, it was almost like a family immediately. And they took me under their wing and I, they showed me around the community. I got to meet a lot of people. And um, I got very involved. I, I loved it. Got to go on fire scenes. I mean, it was an adrenaline rush. And um, again, I got to know a lot of the community members because of the events that we did for the fire department, the pancake feeds and the auctions and so on. Um, but there was something missing on our fire department and it was uh, auto extrication. We didn't do any Jaws of Life. We relied on Detroit Lakes to come and cut people out of the cars. And um, population of 1,300 in our town, we had a lot of, a lot of calls for car accidents. Um, so Detroit Lakes, we paged out and it was 15, 20 minutes for them to get to our town. And we, we kind of felt helpless. You know, we had some tools to pry and things like that, but not to cut. And um, after, a little while on the fire department, we decided, hey, let's, let's start training for this Jaws of Life. Let's at least get so we know what we're doing, get some sawzalls maybe, and, and start the process. And we did. We had a lot of mechanics on our, on our fire department, and we trained to do Jaws of Life, to cut people out of cars. Um, we got Gumby suits. We were doing ice water rescues. Um, big tourist town, so we had a lot of lakes around there, and we were doing drownings and things like that, especially in the wintertime in ice water where fishermen would fall through the ice. Um, Detroit Lakes gave us the approval to start rolling on the car accidents and start cutting before they got there, which was a big thing to us. It's like Detroit Lakes is like the, the big town, you know, they're, they're saying it's okay for us to go. They gave us the thumbs up because we were trained good enough. But I noticed right away that there was something that we didn't train for, and that was the things that we were going to be seeing. The mangled bodies, the mangled cars with bodies wrapped in them. Um, not being able to get in them with cars is as easy as it was on training and have people die in front of us. And it was out of our hands. And I told myself, it's like, okay, I'm going to see things on this that I, I'm going to see dead bodies. And it's not my fault. And over the years, things started happening. I started drinking a little bit more. We started having a lot of calls. And we went through a really bad run where, I mean, it, it literally seemed like it was every other night we got woke up in the night for car accidents. And I noticed myself changing. I noticed myself having difficulties falling asleep. Um, started having some nightmares. Um, started thinking a lot about my kids, a lot more about my kids, um, especially when there was a kid involved in an accident. I'd go home and, and hug my kids, and it, it just changed me. Um, I also started drinking a lot. I used to own a repair shop. I was a mechanic, but I built a, a repair shop in Frazee. And I noticed that I was starting to go across the street to the liquor store after work a lot more and drink until 9, 10 at night, avoiding going home. Um, so I started using that alcohol kind of as a crutch. I didn't realize it at the time. I just thought, you know, I'm going to socialize, get drunk, basically. Um, it wasn't really much about socializing, it was just getting drunk. And uh, I started getting angry. I started taking my anger out on my ex-girlfriend and my kids. And I had a short fuse. Um, it built over the years. I didn't think nothing of it. I figured, hey, I'm a firefighter. We're going to see this. 
it's acceptable. I'm going to have some anger issues, or I'm going to, you know, it's going to bother me. It's, it should. In 2010, I built a brand new shop, and uh, it was a shop of my dreams. It was, it was really, really nice. And I kept myself busy down there doing things on the shop, and then during the day I'd work on the cars. And um, prior to be building that shop, um, I was at some events, and some friends of mine were staying up all night long, and it's like I couldn't understand how they could party all night long, and I'd be wanting to go to sleep around 1, 2 o'clock. And um, also one of them introduced me to meth. And I started doing some meth when I was partying with these guys, you know, and staying up all night long. It was just one or two days, you know, a month. So it wasn't no big deal, I didn't think, you know, and it's not like I'm addicted. But in 2010, when I built the shop, I was so busy, and the nightmares started to get to me that I decided I'm just going to keep myself busy. And in order to stay awake, I was going to use a little more meth. So I had got myself a couple good dealers that would actually bring the meth to the shop. Um, and it was really wild because my shop had surveillance cameras all over, inside and out. So it, you know, it was a really trusting thing for them to be doing that to a, you know, for a firefighter. Um, I was assistant chief at that time, um, and I was doing math. And about the same time I built the shop in 2010, we had a, another car accident. And I had, I'd seen so many car accidents that I knew I was, I was hurting. I mean, it was affecting me, but I didn't want to admit it to myself. But around 2010, we had a car accident where a young individual, high school kid, went off the road and uh, into a pond in the fall of the year. A little ice on there, but he broke through and it flipped upside down underwater at night. And we got there and he was under, uh, underwater for about 10 minutes. And we recovered his body and everything was pitch perfect. It was, it was awesome. I mean, it was better than training. I mean, one swing, I broke the window. We got the body out, got him to shore, they revived him, they brought him back, they brought him back to Fargo. Um, and they were warming him up and they were slowly working on him for quite a while and I was celebrating because this is the first one that we've actually had dead that came back. And, and they said ice water rescues, they can be in the water for up to an hour and you can rescue them and they can come back you know, and live a normal life. And here we were seeing that. And then a month later, a firefighter came into the, my shop and told me that he died. He died from a lung infection when he was in the hospital. And that was the one that broke my back. That one was the one that destroyed me. Because I told myself I was the one that killed him. See, I was the one in the water. I was the one that grabbed a hold of him, bear hugged him, and they drug me to shore. And somehow I put something in his mouth. That's what I told myself. I was the one that killed him. I did something wrong. All the other car accidents started coming back, and I started feeling like I was doing something wrong. I was the Grim Reaper. I was on these calls. I was bad luck. I was the person killing these people. It just built and built and built, and the nightmares got worse. It was my kids in the cars. In my nightmares, the kids were drowning. My kids were on fire. They were locked in a car. They were smashed in a car, and I couldn't get the jaws of life working, or I was paralyzed. And it got to the point where I didn't want to sleep anymore. I couldn't. So I started doing math, a lot more math. I was doing a line an hour. And I did that for two years straight, trying to kill myself with the meth, because every time I closed my eyes, I'd see the same stuff. The anger was out of control. I was isolating down at the shop. I never went home. My girlfriend at the time decided that she had enough. I mean, she's seen the anger. She's seen me turn into a monster. And, um, she left me. She took my two sons with her, and there I was with a house empty all by myself, a shop. I mean, I had, I had money, I had a nice shop, nice career. I was a firefighter, but I was messed up. I was doing a lot of meth. I, I couldn't stop doing the meth. I, I didn't sleep. Uh, my neighbors, I had them all convinced, or I thought I did, that I would go home at night, park my vehicle in the driveway, leave the lights on on timers, though it looked like I was home, and I'd walk back to the shop or ride my bike back to the shop. And, and I thought I was fooling them. I found out later that they knew. They just figured, okay, during the day, he's talking to customers, taking care of business that way, and at night he works on cars. So I had them kind of fooled. They didn't 
really understand where I was getting my sleep in, and I wasn't. But in 2012, when she left, I hit another breaking point to where I started pushing everybody out of my life because I felt like I was a monster. I was evil. I was a jinx, the Grim Reaper. So I didn't want anybody close to me. And that included my kids. And then came 2014 where, I mean, I was still in contact with them and everything. They lived right in town. I was, you know, doing things with them, but it wasn't the same. In 2014, I went over to their house or their apartment and same thing happened that every other day happened. I got angry at nothing. I didn't even know, I don't even know what I was getting angry over, but I yelled at them. I mean, when I yelled, it, it was like I was third party and I was trying to hold myself back, but I couldn't stop it. The, the words came out and some of, the, some of the worst things I've ever said in my life and some of the horrible things I've told my kids, but I, I don't know where they, it was just anger. It, could, it came out and I couldn't stop it. But after that conversation or that episode of yelling at him, I went back down to my shop and I went into my office and I had a really big office with a big horseshoe type desk. And I sat down at my desk and, and I remember telling myself, I can't do this anymore. And I reached into my drawer and I pulled out my 44 Magnum and I put it to my head and I squeezed the trigger that fast. And that hammer came down and it clicked on a revolver. That gun has never failed me. That gun, I used that gun because it was going to do the job. And when it clicked, I didn't understand it. I slammed it down on the desk. I literally climbed the desk behind me. I was up in the corner looking at that gun thinking, what happened? What just happened? What did I just do? I mean, how did that gun not go off? How is it going to go off? Is it going to blow my eardrums out? And finally I got down, I jumped down and I grabbed the gun and I flipped it open and dumped the, dumped the rounds out and, and as I was laying it down, the cylinder wanted to close. So I even had to put a pin in, in the cylinder because I was, it, it didn't make, nothing made sense. I noticed all six rounds and none of them had a dimple on primers. I know what revolvers do, I know how they work. And to, to say that I was in a weird place at that time, I didn't know what was going on. How, how could this happen? How could I get that far to be that desperate to, to, to take my life and then to have the gun not work? I sat down at the desk and I had my keyboard sitting out there and, and it was amazing because I hunt and peck when I type. And I started typing on that keyboard and it just, all, it just flowed. It was, I, I done a ton of Google, Google search. I put in flashbacks, nightmares, anger, math, and I hit enter, and PTSD lit the screen up, and I couldn't believe it. I'm not in the military, never have been, so I'm like, I don't have PTSD. I didn't know what PTSD, otherwise, other than it was a military thing. So I opened up the Mayo site, and I'm looking at the Mayo site, and, and there it was, high risk, military and first responders. And then I got mad at the fire department. I mean, I had this grudge against the fire department somehow because I knew something was wrong with me. I, I didn't put two and two together, but I started to hate everybody. And it's like, why didn't the fire department warn me about PTSD? Why didn't we talk about this stuff? Here's pages of signs and symptoms. And I had every single one of them. It was like looking in a mirror. And then I got down to therapy and medication, different things. It's like, I thought PTSD was a death sentence. You get PTSD, you, you kill yourself or you go on a shooting spree. That's all you hear on the news. There was therapy. I studied PTSD by Google search and YouTube all night long. I mean, I was still high on meth, still doing it once an hour. And at 8 o'clock in the morning, I was so excited that this is what I have. I'm not crazy. I don't have a split personality. I'm not a Jekyll and Hyde. I got PTSD and there's help. So I went over to my ex-girlfriend's apartment at eight o'clock in the morning and she cracked the door open and I pushed my way through. And I was hysterical. I'm like, I've got PTSD. My hands were in the air. Just like when I was angry, I'd, I'd be like a gorilla, you know, just, you know, I never physically hurt him, but just having somebody in the room like that's not good. And I came through there and the passion was 
I found it. I found I'm not crazy. I, I found out what's going on, and I can get some help. And she was backing down the hallway with my two sons behind her, protecting my sons from me. And they were scared. They thought I lost it. They thought I went off my rocker, and I was there to physically hurt them. I left that apartment, went back down to the shop, and I had to walk around the end of that, that desk, and the, my gun was still laying there with the rounds laying there. And I thought I might as well load that thing up and start snapping it till it goes off and end it because they're never going to trust me again. I lost it. I, it. I'm too far gone. I sat down at the desk and I remembered the list of phone numbers I made from years prior. And I started calling phone numbers, helplines. I called a suicide hotline 12 times and nobody answered. I called three other phone numbers that my fire chief gave me five years prior. I called all three of those numbers for first responders and they were all out of service, no longer in service. No forwarding, no nothing. I called a friend of mine that was a police officer, asked him for help. I said, hey, I've got PTSD. I just tried to kill myself. I need help. I need to talk with somebody. And he told me he's going to come pick me up take me to the hospital, they've got to lock me up for my safety. This is a friend I just wanted to talk. I just wanted somebody to listen. And he wanted to lock me up like a dog. I mean, that's not what he wanted to do, but that's what it felt like to me. And that's how, what their training was to get me to a safe place, which I understand that what he was doing. And it, you know, it's, it's what he was trained to do. I told him that I had two more phone calls left. And if those two phone calls don't work, I'll call him back and he can come and get me. Hung the phone up. I had no intentions of calling him back. I sat in my, I actually went out to my shop and lined my propane tanks and my acetylene tanks up in the shop, went back to my office and where I could see him and I, I grabbed an SKS rifle and loaded it up. And I watched my monitors. That's how scared I was that they were going to come and lock me up and take me to a hospital in a funny farm you know, and label me and, you know, get me on all this drugs and stuff and I was going to be drooling. I mean, that's, that's what was going through my head, the embarrassment. After watching the monitors for quite a while, and thank God no police cars came by because I was going to blow the shop up with me in it. Not to hurt the police officers, but I wasn't going to go in under those conditions. And after a while, he never drove by. No other squad cars drove by. I found out later he did call back up and had them come to the police department and um, he waited for me to call. He gave me space. Um, they noticed I was outside later that day after I came out of it and um, you know he made the right move in several different ways. It's, it's just where I was at that's not it didn't feel good. Um, so I called the next list next number on my list and it was to uh, a person that was set up for our fire department. And I was supposed to call her. The phone number was on the whiteboard. And if we're having any issues, we're supposed to give her a call. So I called her and told her I tried to kill myself. I got PTSD, I'm pretty sure of it. And um, she set me up for an appointment a week and a half out after I just told her I was suicidal. I made the appointment and hung the phone up, and I remember looking at the monitors and seeing the sun outside and thinking this is the last sunset I'm going to see because I'm not going to make it a week and a half. I'm not going to make it to sunset. The last phone number on my list was a place my assistant chief had texted me um, quite a while before my suicide attempt. He seen something, didn't know, you know, couldn't put his finger on it. He knew something wasn't right, so he texted me this phone number and and I called it. It rang twice. Guy on the other end of the line answered. I was hysterical. I said, I just tried to kill myself. You've got to keep me from killing myself. I've got PTSD. I need help. I need to talk to somebody. I need somebody to listen. The other person on the other end of the line, after telling my name and everything, goes, Scott, we've got you. We'll get you some help. We're in this together. He was a firefighter from Philadelphia. He stopped everything he was doing and he listened. He understood PTSD. He understood addiction. I didn't say anything about the meth. 
he pretty much knew, but I didn't have to say it. That day I was on the, on the phone with a fire chief from Chicago. I'm sorry, a fire chief from New York and a police chief from Chicago. They stopped their day just to listen and be there for me. I mean, these were three big people and they stopped to listen. They talked to me about therapies. They talked about the village. They, they looked up all these numbers and they said, hey, here's, here's a place that offers EMDR. I'm like, what's EMDR? And they told me it's eye movement desensitization reprocessing. And I said, okay, whatever, you know, I just, I, I gotta do something. And um, they phoned the phone number and I made the phone call. I had to, I had to make the call. And um, I got an appointment for the very next morning. I'm thinking they had a lot to do with that. They probably called ahead and say, hey, if this guy calls, he needs help. And I'm very grateful what, what they did. And the name was uh, Share the Load Program from the National Volunteer Fire Council. So all that night, again, I'm sitting there, you know, didn't want to bother these guys because it was dark and I'm on meth. And how am I supposed to hide that I'm on meth? up 24 hours a day if I call them. So I, I, wasn't, I was in a lot better place. And I knew I had an appointment in the morning, so I, again, did a Google search on EMDR and YouTube videos and eye movement, eye movement desensitization reprocessing. What is this stuff? And I'm watching these videos and say, oh, okay, yeah, this, doesn't, this is witchcraft. This doesn't make any sense. How can you just watch this stuff and it's supposed to help you? And you're supposed to talk about things and, and that's going to make things better. It's like, I don't want my secrets to come out. I was burying all that stuff in the back of my head for a reason. I didn't want to deal with it. And that's what got me in trouble. Well, the next morning, I made it. I made it to the village in Fargo, which was an hour drive, painful, emotionally draining. Got in there. We started talking. Didn't say anything about the fire department. You know, I talked about the first two sessions. I just basically talked about ex-girlfriends. It must be an ex-girlfriend that did this to me. I'm numb. I don't love anybody anymore. I, I, I don't want to be alive. I mean, I was starting to feel like I had a chance at that point, but how can you not have any emotions and be cold? And then the third time we, I went up there, I knew we were going to do the process with the lights and the vibrating pads on my legs, and I was really nervous, to say the least. I parked my car in the parking lot, right across from the police department. I believe it's a police department across the street there and did three huge lines of meth in my car. I couldn't do anything without meth. That was my crutch. That was my bad coping mechanism. And I went inside and I, I did the process of the EMDR. And as we started talking about these ex-girlfriends and I just stopped and I said, <laughs> it was almost like, Scott, you're fooling yourself. Quit BSing yourself. And I started talking about the car accidents. And I could see them, I could smell them. I mean, everything, I could hear the screams, but I relived it. I talked about the car accidents. I talked about the, the nightmares I was having. And there was a connection. And it, it felt like I just emptied my soul out and emptied my head out and all these negative thoughts. I was, I was letting things go. I did a month worth of EMDR. But that first session, when I was driving home, there was a sunflower field and that sunflower field was absolutely amazing the color in it i started seeing colors again and the colors were like neon signs i mean i could tell you what color something was but it was dull after emdr and i started doing emdr the colors came back the food the taste came back it was absolutely amazing after my sessions i couldn't stop smiling my smile was real for once and I uh, got feeling like I was 18 years old, which wasn't bad, but it wasn't exactly good either. Um, one day I was with my kids after the therapy in the, my driveway, and I told my kids, I said, you know, I used to jump picnic tables when I was 18 years old over in the city park in DL, showing off to girls or whatever. And I told my kids, I said, see the picnic table in the yard? Watch this. I felt like I was 18 years old. I felt great. I went and tried to jump the picnic table, and I almost made it. Came down pretty bad. I mean, I crashed. I can't believe I didn't break a leg or twist an ankle, but hobbled back to the car, and my kids were like, wow, Dad, that was pretty cool. And I'm like, you know, I really feel good. So a couple weeks later, after stretching out and looking at that picnic table and having a little conversation with it, 
I went out and I hurdled it two weeks later. And unfortunately, it wasn't like the first time where the neighbors all seen me crash. Nobody's seen it, not even a dog in a neighbor's yard. You know, it's like, this isn't fair. Somebody should have seen this. But I came back to life. I, mean, I was loving life. And the thing about those three lines of meth that I did in the parking lot, those were the last three lines of meth I did, and it was back in August of 2014. I walked away free and clear all by myself. I went through a week of hell laying in bed with walking away from meth, but also having my emotions come back and feeling love. I started to love my kids again, real love. I fell in love with my ex-girlfriend. I got my heart ripped out. But you know, that's also part of the healing. There was too much damage done in our relationship. You know, I, I don't blame her one bit. You know, we, we just, there was just too much there. The relationship with my kids is growing. I mean, they went from not talking to me to calling me for advice on big, big situations. Um, it's just, it's absolutely amazing what, what therapy can do and, and to be able to walk away from math. I mean, I lived on it. I, I dumped ounces of meth down the drain. I mean, that's a lot of money. I was getting, I was buying it by the ounce, having it delivered to my shop, and it, it, you know, it's wild. In fact, one of my dealers actually went clean after I went clean. He didn't think it was possible until I showed him it was possible. And he came to me for advice, and it, it was just a different role I was taking on. I started to realize soon after that that my mechanical skills also went. Um, I, being a mechanic wasn't my thing anymore. I could try to fix vehicles, but they, it just wasn't the same. And it was, it was interesting, because I, I ended up losing my shop. Um, ended up losing my house, actually. But what was really different about that is I was happy. It wasn't about money anymore. I was helping people my path would cross other people's paths. And it was just something like I couldn't understand it. Like all of a sudden I'd take a wrong turn and I'd find out I was right where I was supposed to be. Um, I started speaking a lot. I couldn't shut up. I, I went and talked to our fire department right after this all happened um, when I was going through the first couple of weeks of therapy. And I went into the fire department and told them that I've got to take a leave of absence. I told him I tried to kill myself. I got PTSD. And the room went silent because I was talking about mental health. I remember the, the agenda, the piece of paper that was sitting in front of my, one of my firefighters that was right next to me. And I remember when I was talking to him and telling him that, I remember seeing instantan instantaneously the teardrops hit the piece of paper. I knew I wasn't the only one in that room that was hurting. And later found out that, you know, some, it, it, I, I don't know, I don't get it. I, I just tell what I went through and it seems to help open the doors up for others to go get some help. And that's okay. I was off for about two months, dropped my son off at school and looked up and I seen smoke coming out of a building on Main Street. Driving down there and during the day we don't have a whole lot of firefighters. So I got out of the car and I said, hey, I know I'm on a leave of absence, but you know, can I stand by the truck and just hand stuff out to people? And, and yeah, next thing you know, I'm operating the engine. And the guys are walking by me and slapping me on the back saying, hey, welcome back. You're looking great. I love the smile. You know, I changed. In August that year was probably the biggest life changes I've ever had in my life. And I don't think I'll ever have anything like that before. It was, I ended up having to go see a psychiatrist and ask him, who is this person? Who am I? I talked to my pastor over and over and over. I said, how can somebody go from wanting to kill themselves to being able to go outside and being surrounded by life and loving life and being free? I mean, the EMDR, it was almost like it took, a, took my chest plate off my heart. And I was kind of vulnerable because I gave everybody a chance. I wanted to be there for everybody. I wanted to help everybody. And... I learned fast that I got to make sure I take care of me first also before I can help others. And that's a lot with first responders and doctors and nurses. We have to take care of ourselves first. Make sure we're in a good place. We see a lot. 
especially with COVID going on. We have limited access to social, socialize with each other. We still do our job and it's heavy right now. It's really heavy. I've had lots of nurses reach out to me and doctors. They haven't seen anything like this before. And these are, they, they've been doctors and nurses for a long time. So, you know, we've really got to keep, con keep in contact with each other, keep the education going, have resources available for them, peer support, chaplains, whatever it takes, we have to talk with each other. Um, in December, after my suicide attempt, the reason I knew I changed was because my son noticed it. I was in Fargo shopping with him and I looked at him and I said, you know, I'm really glad that gun didn't go off. And my son said, the gun did go off, Dad. It killed the bad dad. You know, and for him, for him to say that, and, and it really opened my eyes up to the changes possible and, and to walk away from meth and not even be tempted by it. I mean, I work in mental health now. You'd think from being a mechanic, you'd go straight to a straitjacket, not working in mental health. You know, it, now I'm able to help e other people. I travel around the country and I meet amazing people. New York firefighters, I never thought I'd meet a New York firefighter. Even being a full-time fire station, I was never in a fire station that was full-time before. Now I'm in them all the time. I went to a conference in New York and had a, had a firefighter walk out of my presentation screaming at me, yelling at me, calling me names, and escorted him out. I didn't even hear it. It was a big auditorium. And later that evening, that same firefighter, they told me what he looked like, and out of nowhere, here he was, grabbed me, pushed me into the side room, and I thought he was going to beat the crap out of me. Instead, he begged me to keep him from going home and killing himself. He was at that conference to say goodbye to everybody, and I helped him get the treatment that night. You know, I, was, I just happened to be meeting with somebody that was in that field doing the treatment for first responders, and he was right down the hall. I mean, things happen. I got back on the fire department. I went to auto extrication calls, came back. It was different. People stuck around. They wanted to talk about it. They didn't want to just put the equipment away and go home. They wanted to debrief. And, you know, it's kind of weird because I, I wasn't an assistant chief anymore. I went from assistant chief to a red helmet to a, a firefighter in a matter of six months, and nobody asked me about it before my suicide attempt. Now, people come to me and say, hey, so-and-so is acting a little weird. You want to give him a call? You want to reach out and talk to him? It's like, yes, I will, but, you know, it takes a team. We're firefighters, we're nurses, we're doctors, we're a team. We work together. You know, it's... It's amazing how much life can change and to be alive again and not have to worry about any of that stuff haunting me. I probably go through 10 times more stuff now than I did back as a firefighter. I listen to people that are on the phone suicidal. They got a gun in their hand. Many times I can't even call law enforcement because it's a first responder and if they see a squad car pull up out front, I know what they're going to do. So I've got to talk with them. I've got to get them to a safe place. Somehow, I've learned how to process that. I've, I've learned how to put that away and not take it home, not let it eat, eat at me night after night. You know, it'll bother me for a couple of days and it wears off. It's different than it was before. It got caught there. And when it starts getting ca caught up and, and you're thinking about it or you're having flashbacks or you're reminded by something, by seeing a kid or something, and all of a sudden it reminds you of a car accident. I mean, things like that are going to happen, but if it's where it's interfering with your life, it's really important to reach out. I was in a tailspin where I couldn't reach out. I was too far gone. I don't, I don't want anybody to go where I was. It was dark and it was scary and it was lonely. When I talked about that car accident where that vehicle rolled over and that young gentleman died, the thing about that car accident, it was the water was only about waist deep. It was an SUV. The door is most likely automatically locked when it was in gear. So for him to go in at night in the darkness, in the ice cold water, back window we're assuming broke out immediately, so it flooded the car fast. 
the confusion that that kid had, not being able to un un open the door, not knowing which way was up. He probably didn't even know that he was upside down. Because if he would have, and if he would have been able to stay calm, he might have realized that there was probably an air pocket where his feet were in the bottom of the vehicle that would have been up. There might have been an air pocket there, I'm not sure. But if he could have got to that air pocket, maybe he could have stayed alive long enough for us to get there. And the reason I'm talking about that is because I'm letting you people know where the air pocket is. We don't have to crash in life. Find the air pocket, find the help, reach out, talk with somebody. Watch out for the people around you. If they're starting to act out, the anger. You know, if all of a sudden they don't seem like they're happy at work anymore, they're burnt out. Burnout's real. But if we can get them help early enough, you know, we can keep that experience, we can keep that amazing person, bring them back and make it happier for them. We don't know what's happening behind closed doors. Maybe the relationship's going bad and they're taking, you know, and then all of a sudden something happens at work. It's, it's a combination. The divorce rate, the alcoholism, the addictions, we're high risk because we see a lot. You know, it's just it's so important to reach out and do it as soon as possible. As soon as you start seeing something with somebody else or yourself, don't be afraid to reach out. It's the best thing I ever did in my life. I mean, if I wouldn't have, if I would have been successful that day, if, if you'd call it successful, if I would have taken my life that day, all the people I went to met, I wouldn't be here in this room. 35 other people wouldn't be alive today. I'm guessing maybe it's more than that, but I've interfered with 35 suicide attempts. You know, we got to keep going. We got to never give up. We got to, what I like to say is start seeing in color again because it's a beautiful world. And I'm happy. Thank you, Scott. Yep. That was incredibly inspiring. I think I can speak on behalf of the entire room when I say thank you for your courage and sharing that very vulnerable story. I think part of what gives PTSD such power is the stigma that's around it and other types of mental health issues. So the more we can talk about it and be open, the more we make it okay for anybody else who's struggling to do that. And I think especially, like you said, with first responders, um, there's kind of that taboo subject. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think another point is, you know, you mentioned not having to wait until somebody's in, in an extreme position or suicidal, but that if you just start noticing signs and symptoms, it's that's the time to intervene as well. So yeah. um, that's another important point for all of us, I think. We I mean, start noticing different behaviors. To, the to more we out. share, you know, if, if, if something's bothering you, it's okay to talk to somebody about that because they might be feeling the same thing, exactly. especially on car accidents. We, you know, a lot of us are in the same car accidents. This mm -hmm. thing where we're supposed to be superheroes and we're not supposed to have emotions and feelings, right. that's what's killing us. I mean, it's okay not to be okay. Yeah. And I'm guessing it's way more than 35 because those are the ones you know about, but many, many people that have heard you speak that you probably have no idea that you've changed their life as well. So, um, wanted to give our panelists some time to respond and ask a few questions. So, we have some people here from the Grand Forks Fire Department, um, Captain Dewey and Specialist Viela. Did I say that right? Close Viella. <laughs> Viella. Okay. Um, so just wanted to hear your reactions um, as you listen to Scott talk. Um, you know, what comes to your mind? Does it sound familiar as a first responder um, for people on your team? You guys talk about this regularly. Just kind of give us your responses. Yeah, to answer your question, a lot of what Scott said really rings true. Um, just, I think it's pretty courageous to say PTSD. No one likes to say they have any kind of disorder. Uh, that's why I think in a few years from now, we'd be talking about PTSI because it's an injury. They're repeated injuries. It's repeated trauma. It's not a disorder. Um, and yeah, we all kind of live with it. Anyone in the first responder field or doctors, nurses, um, COVID has been rough for everybody, but the trauma that we've experienced in Grand Forks in the last couple of years with fatal car accidents, um, a lot of, we've experienced a lot of trauma, which is hard for everybody. So I think listening to his story really helps um, resonate and know that there is people to talk to and that it's a similar story I've heard of. We've had members who have called for help and, oh, yep, we'll get you an appointment in a week. Or uh, 
we could set you up sometime next month and that's unacceptable and that's what hopefully this kind of ends the stigma and brings that stuff forward to uh to help get people help when they need it and have someone to call yeah thanks scott a lot for sharing um it was it definitely rang true for me um I, I had my own issues with substance abuse and not having a healthy way of coping with our traumas that we experience. Um, for me, I chose alcohol and I experienced that same situation um, just with the gap of not having um, making that phone call. And oh, yeah, two weeks, three weeks, as Joe had mentioned. Um, and, and since then, we we have set up our peer support team. Um, and, and just having, first of all, the ability to acknowledge that you are struggling with something, um, as you mentioned, the stigma, it's okay, Scott, you, you nailed it. It's okay to not be okay. Um, you know, everybody has junk that they deal with in life. Um, and as first responders, doctors, nurses, we, we see the worst of the worst. Um, and so being able to acknowledge that you're not okay and then having resources available, um, that I think some of our other panelists are going to touch on. Um, just remember to always know that you're not weird, you're not messed up, you're not broken. There is hope and there is, uh, there's resources out there. Very well said. We have Melanie Newman here, who is the coordinator of Altru's TEARS program, which stands for Together We Educate About the Realities of Suicide. And the first question I wanted to ask you is just, you know, I think we can probably all agree that 2020 has been a pretty challenging year for all of us, no matter what profession we're in. Um, and if you could just talk a little bit about any tips that you would have for the audience here today or people that are watching this later at home, just about how to deal with challenging times um, and kind of overloaded, overloaded stress. Absolutely. Well, living in a pandemic is not an easy thing, as I'm sure we've all come to realize. I want to highlight two things that I think are really important that we do during the pandemic. One is support. I think support is probably the most important thing to seek out during the pandemic. So we talked a little bit about support already. So how do we do that in our daily lives? So that's connecting with others. Connection is super important. And right now during the pandemic, we're a little more isolated than we normally are. So connection might feel a little more difficult, but I would like to encourage everybody to reach out to those that they love, reach out to their friends, reach out to their family. And you can do this in any way that you feel comfortable in person may not be an option right now, but you could certainly pick up that phone and give them a call, send a text send somebody a message on Facebook, do some FaceTiming, any way that you can to reach out to others because we may not know how much others are struggling and that contact that we make with them could be so important to them and we may not even realize that true level of importance. So I would definitely emphasize support is one thing. Um, also, I'd like to emphasize uh, self-care. Self-care is also very important. It's important all the time, but it's, it's definitely important during a pandemic as well. We need to take care of ourselves. We probably are spending a lot of time worrying during this pandemic, worrying about a lot of different things, worrying about a lot of different people. And sometimes we forget ourselves when we worry like that. So taking care of ourselves and having a self-care routine. A lot of people think self-care is a bubble bath. Well, sure that can be, but self-care is even a little bit more than that. Self-care is more of a routine that you're doing regularly. So it's something, you know, that's making you feel good that you're doing. And people can choose different methods of self-care. So I like some people like to exercise, for example. So making sure you take that time to actually go to the gym or go for a run or go for a walk, whatever your choice of exercise is, and make sure you take that time to do it routinely. It could be anything um, even small, like a, a trip to Target by yourself, you know, just whatever it is that makes you feel good, that nurtures you and gives you that time to sort of regroup and de-escalate. That's so important during a pandemic. So those, those are my two tips. And those are both things that anybody can do. Absolutely. Reach out for that support and try to you know, do that self-care as best we can and remind each other as well. So we have Nicole with us from the Community Violence Intervention Center and she does this magical EMDR that Scott talked about. And so I thought maybe you could just tell our viewers a little bit more about what EMDR is and what it's used for and maybe a little bit about why it works because it is pretty, pretty incredible. Um, 
what it is is it's a therapeutic intervention that is focused on processing trauma Um, it uses something called bilateral stimulation which actively engages bilateral right side to side stimulating you side to side it's most commonly thought of as the eye movements and what happens with emdr is we have you bring up the trauma event or events and we have you call that to mind and then we activate the bilateral stimulation which kind of forces your brain to reprocess as is as is in the name in a way that is going to reduce um, decrease those symptoms of stress um, the distress symptoms Um, but what it does is it activates those neural networks in our brain which we can then access that trauma access those memories and then when we're in a safe environment like in a therapist's office um, that you can reprocess it and close it out and we also see as you mentioned like you've now re-entered into being a first responder and you're already noticing even now you're re- you're processing differently um, so we see success with that too of after you've gone through EMDR those your brain's ability to do that, to process differently after EMDR, stays there. Yeah, I've heard it described before almost as like digesting, like if you think about digesting food, well, you almost have to digest your trauma in a certain way. And when it when you don't, it's just stuck there. And so you have to get that bilateral stimulation to get it to actually be processed or digested. And then, like you said, once you do that, you can do that more often in the future. So. Thank you. That was a good explanation. Can I add to that? Yeah, go right ahead. She, she touched on the safe part of it, you know, and being in a therapist's office mm-hmm. and talking about the stuff that basically is your nightmares, your scary stuff. And to be able to be feeling safe while talking about that and also knowing that that person's there and keeping things in control. So you're not going to go into a flashback, yeah. you know, they you talk about it and they keep you from getting so elevated you know it's it's awesome it's it's a really cool feeling and we reprocess it over and over and over and and all of a sudden it's like that doesn't I don't know, it doesn't hurt me like it used to you know it's it's amazing i mean to have control over the nightmares and the nightmares ceased with me no nightmares no flashbacks no anger the anger disappeared you know because it was all that junk i had in my head that was stuck there it's awesome stuff. I, we, I wish more people did EMDR. My, tear, my eyes tear up when I hear somebody talk about it. So. Yeah. Wonderful. Melanie, I wonder if you could just touch on TEARS a little bit and just maybe tell us all a little bit more about what that program and how you, that program supports survivors of people who have died by suicide. Sure. Well, TEARS stands for Together We Educate About the Realities of Suicide. And as far as how TEARS helps survivors, We do have a survivor support group, and this group is for family members of individuals who have ended their lives by suicide. So these family members uh, go to the group on the third Thursday of every month, and that's a wonderful way for them to gain support uh, from each other. TEARS also has some prevention and education work that we do Um, that's done in the community as well as in the schools. So TEARS does quite a few different things, but lots of different ways that people can learn more and and support each other. Um, And just in general, there are so many options for help in the community. Um, So, you know, we talked about getting support from individuals that are close to you, but maybe sometimes that's not enough. So if you need support from that other person, and by that other person, I mean somebody like a therapist, Um, Totally a wonderful choice to go to see one. I'm definitely an advocate. Um, And when you do that, uh, there are options in the Grand Forks area. So um, at Altru, we have a behavioral health department that does outpatient therapy. Um, Beyond that, there are other community centers. I know Scott mentioned um, the village. We have the village as well um, in Grand Forks. They're a great option. Spectre Health, Northeast Human Service Center, Uh, Prairie Harvest, there's lots of different centers. And the good news is if you don't feel comfortable going in in person, um, a lot of these places offer telehealth as an option. So that's something you could do from home 
and maybe that feels more comfortable. So whatever your comfort level is, there's help available. And there's also help available just simply by picking up the phone and calling 211. That connects you with First Link down in Fargo. Uh, they can handle all kinds of different questions that you may give them. Um, they also handle uh, crisis services for those who are having suicidal thoughts or feelings. So that's something that you can call. You can get local resources, you can get help. There's also a national suicide hotline. So there are people who will answer the phone and talk to you. There are options. Thank you so much. And when we get this production finalized, we'll make sure we include all those phone numbers as well. So everybody who's viewing this later can watch and make sure they can get the help they need. Well, we wanted to leave some time today for any questions that we might have from our live studio audience here. So does anybody have any questions that they would like to ask Scott or any of our panelists? I don't. Um, I'm very fortunate that I, a lot of people ask me, what do I do to keep, you know, keep my grounded, me grounded. But, um, with what I've done around the country, I've actually I've shared the stage with a lot of therapists and psychiatrists, so I'm very fortunate I can pick a phone up and say I need to talk, and boom, they're there. Um, so I don't let it build up, and if I do feel like it's building up, I call and debrief, basically, you know, just, just to talk. And it's amazing how many times I, I do that, and all of a sudden, they bounce stuff back off of me, and then we, we, you know, we share things, and that's a lot of what it is, is we have to speak and communicate with each other. It's that. Yeah, EMDR, if I ever do get to that situation again or think I'm getting there where it feels like something's getting stuck in my head, I'm definitely going back. Trauma, like you said, a lot of times people think of trauma as being this big event. Um, and that is trauma. There's also other types of trauma. Um, a great example is what we're living through right now. We're living through what, in my line of work, we would call a collective trauma, um, where it's really changing a lot of the way that we do things. And there's been a lot of grief and there's been a lot of death. And so looking at trauma, when I look at trauma, it's not always just one big event, but it's, has there been a time in your life where you've had to kind of catch your breath and think, oh my gosh, what just happened? Um, so yeah, there's all types of trauma. There's first responder trauma, military trauma, medical trauma. Um, technically, an argument can be, could be made for childbirth being a trauma. Um, I work in a field where we work with domestic violence trauma, sexual assault trauma, um, more of that interpersonal violence trauma. Um, but yeah, car accidents, natural disasters, um, anything really like that where it doesn't have to be something where you almost die it can be something that if it's changed the way that you maybe walk into a room I'd encourage you to, to seek out somebody to, to talk to about hey what just happened here um, we all carry trauma we all have trauma it's not you know only the worst of the worst. Whatever your trauma is, it matters. It's valid. Um, and it's no less important than, you know, John Doe across from you who's maybe had this big life-changing thing. If it changed your life, it matters. Um, so I'd encourage you to seek out support and people to talk to about that. When we are growing up, when we're children, our brains are forming and they're forming connections. And that's what leads to us building who we are as people. And so if something happens to us when we're children, good or bad, it's going to influence the way that we grow. And if there's been any type of childhood trauma, and if that's maybe the only identified trauma, um, EMDR will still work on that. Even if it happened 60 years ago, um, it will still work because what it's doing is it's pulling that back up and then engaging your brain to reprocess it in a healthy way. But yeah, EMDR works on the big life traumas and it can work on, you know, the smaller things. Um, anything that's kind of stuck in that brain, as Christy had mentioned, trauma interrupts your brain processing. It interrupts the way you encode memories. Um, and what EMDR does is it 
it gives you kind of that second chance to process it again and do it in a way that your brain can file it away in in its little filing cabinet and then you can kind of keep moving forward. The city of Grand Forks has an employee assistance program, which is 24 hours a day. You call 1-800 number and you get to talk to a licensed um, mental health practitioner. And, uh, and that, if that's not doing enough and you want to see a, a real life person, then you can, you can set up and you get basically three free appointments with a live in real person. Um, or they have telehealth stuff now, as, as other people have mentioned. But yeah, the city of Grand Forks does have an employee assistance program similar to what you probably have at All True where you uh, can call 24 hours a day, talk to a real practitioner, and then you can get a live person um, in our area too if you, if you want to move that way. So our peer support team for the Grand Forks Fire Department, uh, we started here about a year ago. It was right before COVID um, kind of hit, and it's through the IAFF, the International Association of Firefighters. Um, through our local union, which is made up of all of the members of the fire department. Um, and we basically went down to Fargo along with the other uh, larger cities in Grand Forks and members to be trained on um, how we can best be a peer support team. And so what we were taught there was some good active listening skills, some real basic things like that, but really just to be able to be that bridge between the the mental health experts and our our people our co-workers our loved ones whoever but primarily it was for each other um, because we leave every time we leave even just a medical call we still have our time to debrief even if it's just the three or four of us that are coming back from that call we have that opportunity um, so yeah with the peer support team it's been around about a year. We haven't had a ton of opportunities due to COVID to get together, um, but we have had, uh, both Joe and I have had the uh, opportunity of using that peer support team um, on a small scale and it's been successful. Uh, the biggest thing I can tell you about any peer support team is you have to build the trust of everybody else that's in that system. There, There's no leaking information. It's only pertinent information with the permission of whoever contacted you so i think a large yeah. part of that too is you think of firefighters law enforcement and everything you know we're supposed to be big and strong but you want to scare a firefighter tell them they got to go see a therapist alone <laughs> you know i mean that scares us i mean it's, you know we're broken or something but you know with the peer support you know i've gotten phone calls i've met them for a lunch afterwards and or drove them to the session I mean, it's just about being there. We're, we call ourselves a family and brothers and sisters and just bringing that back to being there for each other and no judgment. And then another part of that for first responders, um, police officers, ambulance people, doctors, nurses, um, when, when you do see that clinician, you think, you see the other people that are there, your, your patients are there and it's, it's weird. Um, one of the people that we had that went through a lot of this, um, I wish he was here, but he moved. Um, one of his biggest things is the first time he went to get some inpatient therapies. Like, I don't belong with these people. These are the people that I've helped. Like, I, there should be something separate for first responders, doctors, nurses, because you don't want to be with your patients. Uh, but there's nothing that exists yet. But so we got to kind of wade through that territory. But that is, it's tough when you want help and you seek help, and then you see the people that are you thought were broken. No one's broken, but um, those are the people that you used to try to help, and now you're kind of lumped in with them it's a weird feeling I think that's kind of what Scott was saying um, but getting the help and, and knowing that those phone numbers are available whether it's 1-800 numbers um, we all carry a, a card that has four numbers on it that are 24-hour hotlines for people to call uh, anonymously as well as the peer support thing that we talked about and the, the police department also has a, their own peer support program that works pretty well I don't know if you want to ask them about that or not so yeah we have had a peer assistance support team for many years and really anytime our officers are involved in a critical incident or significantly unusual incident um, we get our peer assistance support team together and it's uh, we have diffusings pretty much immediately after the event so uh, usually before the shift is over 
Um, depending on the level of the situation, uh, we'll also have a, a debriefing within uh, the first few days after the incident. Um, and uh, as uh, Joe was mentioning, we do um, now have the capability of having annual um, mental health wellness checks for each and every one of our sworn employees. We just started that this year. Uh, it's a requirement. All officers are required to see our mental health professional. It's a uh, doctor in uh, Fargo that specializes in law enforcement. Uh, their participation level is up to them. They can sit there and talk about fishing if they want, or they can start unpacking some of the uh, traumas that they've suffered. Uh, officers see the same things that firefighters do, that nurses do, doctors do, things like that. But then we also have the unfortunate uh, um, chances where we have to uh, use force against people. Uh, and that's not just firearms like people think. Uh, it's batons and it's actually going hands-on and wrestling with someone and feeling that person's body do something that it wasn't designed to do and hearing things pop and uh, things like that. And these are things that officers, you know, much like the firefighters that have uh, been discussing this, um, think about uh, quite a bit too. And, uh, you know, when you're at home making uh, supper and you snap that uh, um, celery, it brings back memories. So that's why we are now requiring our officers every year um, to go see a mental health professional. It does cost a significant amount of money. However, there is no investment too great for, uh, for our officers. If it helps them maintain a, a healthy, productive career, it's worthwhile. Yeah, Lieutenant Mackey, I just think it's so awesome because it really normalizes it too. It's like, this is for everybody. This isn't, we didn't pick you out to send you because we think something's wrong or you're broken. This is, we just know this takes a toll on everybody. So we're gonna have you all check in once a year. Yeah, I love that. Thank you. It's exciting to see it being brought into the fire departments and the police departments because yeah. 10 years ago it wasn't there. Six years ago when I first spoke in Duluth at the Chiefs Conference, it was silent. And I mean, it was a lot. It, it, when I speak at some of these places, you can tell them in his tears. Yeah. They don't dare make eye contact with each other because somebody's finally talking about mental health. Yeah. I love the way the silence is being broken, the stigma is being broken. Mm -hmm. It's okay. You talk about the photo book of, of trauma or that list of trauma that you already have in your brain, and then you're gonna you're gonna talk to someone else and put theirs in there too. So you, one of the things we learned in our class that we went to in Fargo for a couple of days was was how to, to you got to know how to process your stuff before you're gonna help anybody else. Um, so I don't know if I'm answering your question or not, but that is one of the difficult things is um, if you, if you're in the field that you're in this room, you're gonna watch this video. Have you digested the things that you've seen and done? Um, before you can help digest somebody else's. So I think self-care is one of the things we really learned that you have to be able to take care of yourself. Scott mentioned it as well before you're gonna, you're gonna try to help other people. So yeah, I kinda, James kind of said it too that we, we just try to be the bridge. We're not gonna let them fully unload on us. We're just gonna try to listen um, and give them whatever care and whatever pointers we can at the time and then be the bridge to get them to wherever they need to go, whether it's a live in-person clinician, whether it's just a phone call with someone more important, they're more knowledgeable than us, or, or what that could be. But I think if you're going to look at trying to help other people in this in this mental health field, it's I think the bridge is a good analogy of you don't have to solve their problems, you don't have to you don't have to be the person that fixes them. They're not broken, they're not fixing, but you don't have to be the person that really helps them right now. You just got to get them to where they need to be. So that's what that's what our goal is: just to be the bridge, kind of let them unload if they need to, um, be a good listener and help them through the process and get them to where they need to be. Yeah, that's a great analogy. Just be the bridge for all of us. You know, that's a big job. You don't have to have all the answers. Um, I just want to add to that in terms of as the person that you're bridging to, um, that it's the same for me too, as a therapist, as sitting in that room, hearing other people's traumas um, and hearing as supervisors that you're hearing, you know, the supervisee's traumas and you're maybe then taking it to your supervisor and, um, that I think you really hit on it, and I just want to come in from that other angle too of making sure you're finding the supports you need, whether that means you're seeking out, you know, mental health services yourself, um, that you're dealing with your own stuff too, so that you can make that space for, you know, other people's stuff. Um, because there's also a good chance, like if I didn't deal with my stuff, there's a good chance I'm not going to be able to help anybody else deal with their stuff, because 
you know, if they're sitting across from me in my office and they say something and it brings something up for me and then I wander down this path of, oh, this happened to me once, then I'm no longer doing my job because then it becomes about me and not about who I'm sitting across from, who I'm there to help with. But yeah, so I just wanted to add from that too of therapists also (laughs) seek that out and, you know, we aren't, we aren't superhumans either. Um, We have our own support networks and all that stuff. So I just wanted to add to that. And you have to do your own self-care and sort of know your own little triggers. Thank you for all the wonderful participation. That was great. Um, Wanted to give you the last word, Scott, if you have anything else you want to add to wrap us up. Um, Yeah, just if you feel things building and something's not right, by all means, just talk to somebody about it. Don't hold it in. You know, it's it's sad that we have uh, first responders taking their lives more than they're losing their lives in line of duty deaths and the divorce rates and the alcoholism and addictions and the broken families, you know, parents coming home and not being able to be parents because they've got all this stuff from the job or vice versa. They're going to work and they're having issues at work or at home. You know, it's just so important for people just to, you know, like firefighters, just swallow your pride. Just go get some help. I mean, be a better person. It, I didn't, I never thought this would feel so good to be alive. You know, it, it definitely changes you. It helps. Um, and they were talking about, you know, in the provider role, um, I work in mental health crisis stabilization now. And I answer crisis calls and from all around the country on my own phone and I meet with people and like I think I said earlier, the amount of, of things that I hear in a day, I don't know how that little bit back then, you know, I hear 10 times more now and, and to be able to process it and, and to learn to do that. She said the EMDR, you know, after that, it kind of teaches you how to process it and it makes you a better person. I love the smile. I love that the anger is gone. I love that I can let somebody just yell at me and just and not absorb it but understand they're not yelling at me, they're not mad at me, they're mad at something that happened and not judge them. And after that, let's go talk to somebody, you know, because stay in your lane. I'm a firefighter. I kind of also work in mental health, but I, first thing is I want them to get to therapy. And if it's a matter of me going with them to the first couple sessions and waiting for them in the parking lot, going to have lunch afterwards, I'll do it. That's so important and that's the peer part. So we got to be there for each other, and it's just a whole new life when you get rid of all that baggage. Yeah, well said, and I think um, I loved what you said about seeing the color again, and I think that's we all deserve to see the color again. Well, thank you, Scott and panelists, for sharing your story and insights. For anyone watching at home who feels the additional challenges of the present times, know that our community stands with you and that our community has resources to help. Some of those resources will accompany this video. Stay tuned to our social media and YouTube channels for more updates 